Word of mouth guy of Spike Jones, group director of engagement. I don't even know what that means, so it really doesn't matter that you mess it up, so it's no big deal. Um, and WCG is just an, you know, an acronym, and we don't know what it stands for either, so we just, uh, just kind of go along with it. So we talked about statistics, and we talked about data, which is a fantastic thing. I am not a numbers person. I understand numbers. I, that's why I married a CPA. She is the numbers person of our family. And we're going to talk a little bit about numbers as well, but as they said in the intro, we're going to talk about something that you already know about. So hopefully at the end of our time together, you will have, uh, I, I will have made you think about some things differently, and that's my job today. I'm the old school word of mouth guy. And the great thing about word of mouth is, like I said, it's been around forever. Anytime I do a presentation, I put this slide up first, because this is why word of mouth is so important these days, and Hugh McLeod is fantastic. But for our reasons and our purposes, I've updated this slide to say this, because if you talk to people in real life the way you talk to people on social media, they would punch you in the face. Um, we get to work with a lot of great, big, uh, famous clients, and so do you guys on a regular basis. But we're also seeing that we're still in this advertising mentality on social a lot. There are very few companies that do it very, very well, right? And we are saying things to our customers on those channels that we would never, ever say to them at a cocktail party. And so I want you to keep that in mind. Like they said, word of mouth has been around forever, right? First caveman said, the second caveman, where'd you get that? He said, down behind the cave. Word of mouth was invented, right? That, that day. Um, so here are my very few statistics. I usually like to say that you know, over 90% of word of mouth happens offline. And this is studies that they've done for the past five years. But a better way to put it is a study that came out last year that says 3.3 billion mentions of brands happen on a typical day in the US. Right? These are conversations people are having uh, about brands. The interesting thing is 3.1 billion of those are not on social media. And that is a crap ton, right? That is a whole, whole bunch. Those ones that are on social, they move quickly, they spread, right? And I'm not saying that this, these conversations are not something where someone saw somebody, something on social, someone shared a video with them, they read something, and then they went to the water cooler at work and talked about it. Because that's how the good word of mouth works. But as we walk through our time together, I just want you to keep this in mind, right? I want you to keep this in mind that there is a massive amount of conversations that don't take place on social media. And it is our jobs to make sure we have an experience with our customers that is so awesome they're going to go online and talk about it, or they have an experience online that is so awesome that they're going to go offline and talk about it, right? And that's how real word of mouth works, and that's powerful word of mouth. And it can manifest itself in a lot of different ways, and we'll talk about some of those as well. Um, advertising is fantastic. Advertising will never go away. I love great advertising. Um, how many people saw the new Dove stuff that they just put out? With the, that's unbelievable. Very, very powerful stuff uh, with the sketch artists. Unbelievable, all right? And so this is a great way for th them to get the word out, right? This is advertising. Now, we spread it through our social channels, but they're making people aware that they exist. All right? And that's what advertising is for. It will never go away. I need to tell people I have a new car that's coming out. I have a new service. I'm going to buy a Super Bowl ad. I'm going to buy a banner ad. I'm going to tell people about it. The crappy thing about advertising and awareness is that it doesn't give you this. Credibility. Right? Because I can stand up here and tell you that Spike Jones is super, super smart. And before I got married, I had a lot of dates. I'm trying to make you aware that I believe those things about myself. You don't know me. So, because if you did, like Chuck did, he, you would know that none of those things are true, right? There's no credibility to those statements. But if you talk to Chuck, you go, Chuck, is Spike really, really smart? And he'd say, hell no, right? He brings credibility into that conversation because you trust him. If, unless you don't know him, then you don't trust him, right? But that's where word of mouth lives and breathes. It is that credibility. That's what we bring to the conversation, right? It is when you're going to go buy a car, you're going to go online. You're going to read about it. You're going to check out the ratings and reviews. You're going to do all your research on, auto, uh, on the auto blogs and read all that stuff. And that's fantastic, as you well should. But if your neighbor or your sister or someone in your family has that exact car, you're probably going to go to them first, and you're probably going to trust their word a lot more than you are those people online, right? It's that credibility that, that word of mouth brings into the, uh, into the fold. So... We actually have clients that come to us and they say, this is, these are verbatims, my friends, right? And I'm sure you have dealt with this yourself. And the newest thing is likes. We want likes. Well, why do you want, why do you want 8 million likes? 
because our competitor has 7 million likes and we want to we beat them. All right, well, why do you want those followers? Because we want followers. That's what this game is, right? It's a whole gamification that's happening. And how many can I get? They're like little pawn pieces, right, that we, that we can collect. And so whenever they say things to us like this, we say things to them like this. <laughs> and if we're really, if it's a good relationship and we know them really well, then we'll give them one of these, right? <laughs> because we have to... We've, we're doing a poor job as marketers of asking them why. What is the business purpose behind this? What are we trying to achieve, right? Why do we want to get these followers? I mean, and we'll talk about likes in a second. And, you know, I hate to pick on likes. But as you guys well know, when someone goes, you know, uh, I just read Augie Ray just wrote a great blog post like today or yesterday that talks about a lot of this and how Einstein bagels, you know, every time someone they did, did a campaign and if you went and liked their page, you got a free bagel. So they had like a 7,000% increase in, in likes in a day. And the reports just came out, and they're doing the worst in their industry now, right? But they gave away a crap load of free bagels, right? But what's the business purpose behind it? And again, these are things that you guys already know, but I just want to set the stage a little bit. So one of the things that Tom talked about that I completely agree with is this idea of community. Man, I grew up in the suburbs of Dallas, and... You know, we lived in a community. And when you went out of town, you went on vacation with your family, you went to your neighbors and you said, hey, man, could you, could you look after my, my house? You know, I'm, I'm going out of town to take, take care of my dog, get my mail, get my paper right. The, we'd have uh, neighborhood uh, events where everyone would come and you'd pull out the grills and you knew all your neighbors' names. And we've really gotten away from that. And it's great to hear what Tom said about how we're going towards, uh, back towards that again. But I set it up like that because the word community has been bastardized now because of social media. I hate this word community now. Because just because you have a Facebook page and people come and comment on it, now you think you have a community, right? We have community managers that manage these social platforms. But are they really communities? Just because people are in the same place, is that a community? That's not the kind of community that I grew up in, right? Think of it this way. I used to live in a big, tall building in downtown Austin. I have neighbors all around me just because they live across the hall, they live next to me, right? These are people that I live in the same vicinity. We show up at the same places, right? We leave to go to work in the morning, we come home, I, but I hardly know any of their names. I actually hate a lot of them, right? <laughs> because they're very, very loud. Because there's a huge difference between being a neighbor and being neighborly, right? And so when we, when we establish these communities online and like-minded people come, right, and participate, we have to remember that just because they show up in the same place does not necessarily mean that they like each other, right? Because <laughs> you can live next to someone or show up in the same place as someone and hate them, and that is not necessarily a community, right? And so I think we need to keep that in mind as well. So been very, very fortunate to do a lot of great, or I won't say great, a lot of word of mouth uh, programs over the years. Some of them great, some of them meh, but that's what we do as marketers. We learn, we live and learn, right? But I really wanted to pick out five things that I've really learned over the past however many years doing this. So the good thing about these is these, these are actually based on real work. Nothing you will hear is philosophy. These are things that have actually gone out there and we have worked at, uh, on and that have been successful. I'll, but I'll also talk about some of the things that uh, we have failed on as well because we have to learn from those things. And again, hopefully, you know, some of these you will nod your head and go, yes, Spike, I totally understand that. You're not telling me anything new. You're wasting my time. And hopefully, as some of these will go, oh, I didn't think of it that way, and that's my job today. So the first one is one of the ones you probably already know. And these are the, one of the things that we all tell our clients all the time. Look, it's not about you. I don't want you to go on social. I don't want you to go out there in the world and talk about yourself, because everyone's going to turn that off. We like to think of it in a different way. We say, don't talk about product. We talk about passion, right? And passion is a big buzzword in our industry right now. But really going back and reframing the conversation about people's passion. Um, I read an article recently about how every brand should have a cause. And I agree with that to a certain extent because companies like Tom's, all right, that is an obvious cause, right? This is putting shoes on people in other nations that do not have shoes. That is a cause at how we usually define it. But causes can manifest themselves in very many different ways, right? If you stand for the passions of your customers, you're going to start standing for a cause. And it's not, doesn't, Curing cancer is great, you know, medical research is fantastic. Those are the causes that we usually talk about. But there are other causes, too. There are causes that enhance people's lives on a daily basis, that make them happier, right? Because, look at Patagonia, all right? They, 
they are a company that is a cause, right? It is environmentalism, and again, that goes back to what we traditionally think of as a cause, but you don't necessarily, necessarily always have to be aligned with a Susan G. Komen or anything like that, and we'll talk about it. So it is our job to talk to our clients and say, look, man, we have our customers, <clears throat> we have what our customers care about the most in the world, and we need to be the thing that connects them. We are the conduit. And if we are the conduit, and if I'm able to go out there and let my customers talk about the stuff that they love even more, I enable that conversation. Now I have a right to be in that conversation as well, right? And so I think we have to think of the things that we can do to create that content. Of course, you have to have a social media cat in these damn presentations these days, right? And you, but you have to solve for excited kitty. What do your customers get excited about? And sometimes you'll be surprised what they would get excited about, especially when it comes to your product, all right? Unfortunately, we do, we do not all work on, on Apple. We don't have sexy products to always talk about, right? There are actually products in the world like this. And that is not necessarily sexy. Who here has WD-40 in their home right now, though? What do you use WD-40 for? There's always someone who says everything. And I always think of like the dad on my big fat Greek wedding with the Windex, right? And he's always afraid of everything. Now, I, I'm a normal person, so I use it for squeaky stuff, right? Something is squeaky in my house, a door jam or a bicycle or whatever, and I'll spray it on there. And they'll, they'll look, it's fixed. Do you know that WD-40 has an online fan club? Did you know that? Did you know there are people like Todd who go on there and talk about how he sprays it on his fish bait because it allows him to catch more fish, or how he can kill wasps uh, that nest in around the, the doors of his car without damaging the paint. Now, Todd has a lot of issues. <laughs> but he is not talking about WD-40 in a squeaky thing, fixer way. He's talking about it catching more fish, which he probably loves to fish, right? And he talks about it in killing wasps, and that, again, I don't know why wasps are building uh, nest in his car doors. That's a whole different issue that he's got going on, but it's a different conversation than fixing squeaky things. Now, should WD-40 go market to fishermen? No, but this is a new conversation that they can have with different audiences, right? He's talking about his passion, and WD-40 allows him to pursue those things even more. This is, I'm only going to mention this case study twice because most of you are hopefully already familiar with it. This was one of my former clients. If you've ever owned a pair of orange handled scissors in your entire life, you know who Fiskars is. This is a very sexy product, my friends. I know you're jealous that I got to work on this. They came to us and they said, hey guys, nobody talks about scissors online. And we said, you are kidding. <laughs> so they said, we want more people to talk about scissors online. And I say, I go online all the time and go, oh, the angle of the blade is that, no, you no one talks about that stuff. But we found these people called scrapbookers. Anyone here a scrapbooker? Anyone here know a scrapbooker? Like, it's a cult, right? It's a $3 billion industry in the United States alone. Paper and scissors, all right? And it's, it's not what you normally think. If you don't know a scrapbooker, I suggest that you get to know one because these people are passionate about what they do. They make these beautiful works of art that capture memories of their lives and other people's lives that they pass down from generation to generation or give away as gifts, whatever that might be. So we go back to the scissor company and we say, we're not going to try to get people to talk about scissors online. We want people to talk about what they do with your scissors online. All right? Now it's a passion conversation. We are the conduit that connects the person and what they love to do, so now we have a right to be there. And that bleeds into their lives. So now we get to talk with them about weddings and, and birthdays and uh, all these fantastic things that happen in people's lives. We're part of that conversation because we're hosting that conversation, right? No longer product. Now it's passion. That's number one. Number two. So that says create it underneath there. Uh, don't seek out influence, create it. So at WCG, one of the great products that we have, product plug, that Chuck does, that Chuck's group uh, leads, is we go out and we find influencers. So any, anything you could ever think of, we go out and we'll find the influencers, top 50, top 200 influencers. And this is fantastic because to me, influencers are the new advertising, right? We get in front of them, we pitch them, say, oh, please talk about my stuff. And they go out to their minions and they talk about their stuff. The bad thing is, with, with influencers, is they're not usually very loyal, right? So at my former company, we worked with a lot of influencers in the automotive industry because I worked for Chevy. So the new Camaro's coming out. I know all the uh, uh, automotive bloggers, right? So I get, I get them a Camaro, they get to drive it around for like a month. And so, of course, they go blog about it and they talk about it. 
Well, that's fantastic because that gets me a lot of buzz. It gets me a lot of awareness. The bad thing is the new Mustang comes out three months later. And so what does Ford do? Exact same thing. And so now they talk, go out and they talk about the Mustang. So this is a great top-down model because, again, it's for awareness. But what I like to think about is finding people who are already passionate about you and then making them influential. And we'll talk about that. Because Oprah, remember Oprah, God rest her soul, when she had an Oprah show? Uh, she did her favorite things episodes. Remember the favorite things episodes, right? No, okay, she did, so everyone in the audience got all this free crap, and she talks about like, her favorite products in the world. And we, we would see those product sales spike. Right? But then over the next months, what happens? Start going down, down, down. Right? She gave them great awareness, and that's fantastic, because she was very influential. But then there's people like these folks, and this is the only other time I'll mention the Fisketeers. And this is the scissor people, right? The, we had an event. These people showed up. This was not a costume event. <laughs> these people showed up dressed like this. They are scrapbooking superheroes. And you'll see on their, on their hip, they have their little holder for their scissors, and they're doing their, like their scissor gang sign, right? And their names are like Scrappin' and Robin, or Scrap Man, I don't even remember. But they showed up like this, and we said, that is awesome. So we took a picture of them, we put it on the website in front of their peers, and they started gaining influence among their peers, right? So we plucked these people out of obscur obscurity, excuse me, obscurity, and we made them famous. And because we made them famous, now they're very, very loyal to us because we made them look important in front of their peers, and we'll talk about that in a second as well. This guy's name's Jared. Jared is a designer. He's in Dallas. Um, he's actually an immigrant from Ireland. And when we started uh, a program for Chevrolet about uh, going out there for the new Camaro and starting to talk to people who are very passionate about cars, we found this guy on an old-school automotive uh, forum. Remember forums? Anyone here still go on forums? I mean, I know developers and other people do, yeah. So old school. But this guy would not shut up about how excited he was about the new Camaro. Now, mind you, Jared has a following of 12 people on Twitter. He does not have a blog. He does not have a YouTube. Actually, he had a YouTube channel with like four, uh, uh, four followers on there and probably a total of like 200 views of all of his things that he put together, right? He's not an influential person in the automotive world but he is passionate about Chevy Camaros. So we contact Jared. We say, hey, man, we'd like to come up to Dallas. We want to stick a camera in your face, and we want you to talk about your passions. That's it. And he said, sure, man, come on up. So we spent a Saturday with Jared, went up there with the high-def camera, someone working a boom mic, very, very low cost for us. And we sat down with him, and, he's just, and we just said, go. So we made this video, and the first part of it is Jared's talking about graphic design and how he got into graphic design in the 80s when it was... Uh, uh, Airbrushing. Remember, you had one of those airbrush named T-shirts, didn't you? I know, or a van, which is kind of creepy. Uh, but you remember that, right? You went to Six Flags and got it. But so he talks about his love of graphic design, how that's evolved over the years, and how he really has gotten into the design community and things that inspire him. And then, of course, second half is him and his Camaro, right? His bright orange Camaro with the black racing stripes, and he's out there rubbing it with a diaper or whatever these guys do, right? And he's talking about his passion for it. So we said, this is fantastic. So. We went back, we edited it down to about three minutes. In the first half, he's talking about his love of design. Second half, is about the car. And we went, came back to him, and we said, dude, thank you so much for being such a great fan of Chevrolet. We really appreciate it. We packaged up the, the video, and we gave it to him, and we walked away. We did not post it on Chevy.com. We did not post it on our Facebook page. We did not post it on our Twitter account. We didn't do anything. We just said, thanks, man. Really appreciate it. What do you think Jared did? He went and posted the crap out of it over everything that he could imagine. So he goes to YouTube and he posts it. He goes back to the forum and he posts it. And everyone on the forum goes, holy crap, how did this happen? This is the coolest thing ever, right? The guy gets 12,000 views on YouTube in a week by himself. This, he becomes the most influential person on Twitter in a week for Chevy Camaros, right? You can Google um, Chevy Ignites and you can see the video. So we made Jared feel important. Now he's important in front of his peers, and we actually used him to start this program, and so he got to invite the next people in about who we're going to make the video about, right? And it happened to be a, soccer, uh, a baseball mom who her favorite thing was going and, and looking at her, or watching her kids play baseball, right? So we went out to their little league games, and we shot them, like, coming around the corner in slow motion, like, the smoke's coming out, right? So she goes and posts that, and all her friends go ape shit for it. So we're creating these little pockets of influence, right? And so it's a new way to think about it, because he is now influential in that world, and he is never going to go to Ford. If Ford comes to him, he'll go, get the F out of here. I'm a Chevy guy, and always will be, because we made him feel important. So it's a different way to think about it. 
We had industry uh, blogs came to him, interviewed him. We did not give him a script, but he said all the right things, thank God. Um, but we just wanted to make him look and feel important. And we'll talk about that in a second as well. Influence can be created, but passion cannot. Right? Influence can be created, passion cannot. I cannot get you to care about my stuff. Number three, your community is not for everybody. One of the things that we learned when we create these communities with these ambassador programs, these things where passionate people are members, is that we try to keep people out. Right? There is so many, there's so much crap out there, and all you got to do is go create a username and a password, and you're in. And you look around, and you never come back. Right? When we create communities this way, where you, you just sign up and you, for a username and password, we see a less than 10% engagement rate. When we try to keep people out, we see a 30 plus percent engagement rate. And so example is we'll create, a, um, we'll create a community. You have to go to the community site. You click on the leads. You, look, you read about them, whichever one you feel most connected to. You send them an email or you fill out a form, right? And you say, I'd like to be part of this group. And within 24 hours, you get an automated response that says, we are so excited that you want to be a part of our group. We just can't wait for you to be here. Why don't you tell us why? we'll lose 75 to 80% of people right there. And that's great, because I don't want them. And we don't care what you email me back. I say, I want free stuff. My sister is part of this group. Like, uh, I'm your competitor. I want to check this out. Like, whatever it is, we don't care. But as long as you email us back, we know that you have at least a little bit of interest and we'll let you in. You get a secret URL, a secret password, now you're in the club, right? Because people want to feel important. They want to feel elite. Because when you're let into the club, what's the first thing that you go do? You go tell other people where it is, yes, right? You know, I don't fly enough to be part of any of the Admiral or Sky or whatever those are, but when I'm in the airport and those doors slide open, what do you do? You're looking in there, what the fuck is going on in there? Are you getting massages or something? But if you're a member there, like Chuck is, you'll come out and go, yeah, man, I got boozed up because I get all these free drinks and I got whatever, right? You want to tell other people. So it is that part of feeling elite, right? People want to feel elite, so let's help them feel elite. Number four, find your rallying cry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow through this pretty quickly, but this comes back to branding. And I think fundamentally we've forgotten about branding when it comes to social media and when it comes to word of mouth. We've forgotten. Everybody wants to be a part of something bigger than themselves, right? My, uh, remember the Livestrong back in the day before Lance Armstrong, blah, blah, blah? Who, wore, who used to wear a yellow? Who, who wore one even up until the whole Lance Armstrong thing? Right? So everyone else took theirs off. So you like cancer now? Is that, is that what it is? <laughs> I don't understand. But when that, those first came out, you couldn't find them. And so when you had one, like when they first came out and someone else had one, like in the airport, you're like, yeah, fighting cancer. <laughs> Lance Armstrong, let's go. Yeah, right? So it's this idea of, of we want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Where are my Texans? Texans? All right, I'm, I apologize for the next three minutes because I'm about to get all Texas on you, okay? They brainwashed us when we were kids, right? My grandfather said, never ask a man where he's from. If he's from Texas, he'll tell you. If he's not, don't embarrass him. But one of my good friends from Oklahoma says the best thing ever came out of Texas is I-35, right? <laughs> Anybody know what this is? This is the first flag of Texas. Mid-1800s, these Texans go in this little town outside of San Antonio. They kick out the Spanish army, and they take the general's cannon. General goes back to Santa Ana. He says, I need to go get my stuff back. He's like, damn right, you're going to go get your stuff back. So he sends a couple of big platoons. They surround the city. They say, we want our stuff back. Texans, within 30 minutes... They create this flag, and they raise it above the city. It becomes the first flag of Texas. It's a star, a picture of the cannon, and the words, come and take it. <laughs> right? It gives me cold chills as a Texan. Every time I tell that story, because, again, I'm brainwashed, but it's, it's part of my identity, right? It's a rallying cry, like, screw you. This is where I'm from. What's this? What's the rallying cry? Remember the Alamo. What's this? One of the greatest anti-litter campaigns ever created. Did you know it was an anti-litter campaign? Anti-litter campaign. Long story short, I'll be happy to tell you the long story one day, but the short story is that litter on Texas roadways dropped over 75% in three years because of this. Don't mess with Texas. And now the University of Texas has stolen it, and you know, we have to deal with that. But it is this sense of pride, right? It is this, I want to be a part of something bigger than myself. It is hardwired in our DNA as humans to want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. Religion, I am a Buddhist, I am a Christian, I am a Catholic. I am a sports fan of this team. I have a friend, uh, when I lived in South Carolina, uh, he did not go to Clemson University. He did not play football for Clemson University, yet during football season, he would come in on Monday and go, did you see the game? Oh, we sucked. 
or we were so awesome. Did not go to school there, does not play football with them, but he uses the word, how can we create we experiences, right? So when our company wins, they feel like they're winning. When our company hurts, they want to defend us because they feel, feel like they're hurting as well. Even brands, of course. Used to work with a guy, anytime his Mac would crash, he would blame himself, right? Oh, user error, I must have done something wrong. You must have done something wrong, right? So how do you create those experiences? Okay, last one. Think about content differently, all right? There are a lot of, there are a lot of uh, conversations these days about content. What good content is, what bad content is, content this, we need a content strategy, content, 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 all right? And I don't want to dispel any of those things, but I want you to start thinking about it differently. So a great report came out, uh, and I'll be happy to send anyone the link that wants it, but uh, it talks about why people share content, right? Top three reasons why people share content. And so the great thing about this is, is it talked about why people share content online, and then it talked about why people share content offline. So if you had to guess, what's the number one reason someone shares a piece of content online? They want a reaction. Why do they want a reaction? What? Well, they want people to like them, so, it, so it'll feed their ego, right? The number one reason why people share content online is ego. We are egomaniacs online, right? Think about it. Look where I am. Look what I'm eating. Look who I'm with. Look at the, you know, if someone tags me in a picture on Facebook that's not, doesn't make me look good, what do you do? Immediately untag that, right? I don't want people looking at that, but it's ego. So how can we create pieces of content that feed that ego? Think about Jared. Took this guy who's just a gearhead in a forum that loves Chevy Camaros, and I made him look important. I fed his ego. He's not an egotistical guy, but I made him feel important, all right? So I've got this bucket, and I want to feel, fill that ego bucket whenever I'm creating content, because I know if I do that and make someone look good, they're going to share it with their friends and say, look at this cool thing, right? Look at me. Number two reason that people, sh uh, because we've got this, right? Facebook version of you, realistic version of you. You know it's true. You know it's so true. Just ran 4.8 miles using RunKeeper. I, I didn't. <laughs> just meditated for 38 minutes using meditating. I didn't. Right? Come on. All right. Number two reason why people share things online. What do you think? Because they like it. It's information. I found this out. I, I, I had a problem. I solved it. Or I found this in, uh, in some sort of forum. Or I watched a video and I solved it. Or, or look at this new thing that's out that I found. And I want to share this out to my community. All right? Right? So it's information. So now we have an information bucket. How can we give people information? It's one of the great things about ambassador programs. One of the things we do is we, we show them what's underneath the kimono. Right? We show them the bumps and bruises of a company and say, here are our problems. Please help us out. Because now they have information. And they go out to their friends and they go, look at this cool thing that's happened to me, ego. And they say, look at this cool thing that I learned about this company. I want to share it with you because you didn't know it. Right? And then the number three reason why people share things online is, what do you think? It's emotion, right? Okay, and a lot of times that's funny. It's, it's, it's memes and funny things that are out there, right? Uh, it's, it can be very, very uh, uh, sad and emotional, and we, but we'll see people share those things. Oh, this is so funny, or oh, this made me think, or this is so sad. Um, remember this? Most viral video of all time, right? How much money did they raise? Jack squat, right? But, so that's the problem. That's the problem. We know people are going to share these things out, and we're going to gain that awareness, but then we're losing out because these face-to-face, -face, we need to make sure these face-to-face -face things happen, right? Where do we connect those dots? So, because there's only so much we can do behind a computer screen, right? And again, it goes back to that ego thing. People are, a lot of people are online. Their online personas are nothing like their offline personas, right? Because they want to feel good. We see people that are, get angrier faster. They're quicker to challenge. You know, they'll say things online that they'll never say offline. It all has to do with that ego thing, too. Interesting thing about um, that uh, study is they went and said, why do people share content offline? The number one reason why people share content offline is emotion. Number two is information, and number three is ego. It's flipped. Because I already have a relationship with you, so I don't have to be egotistical to you. You already know I'm a complete asshole, right? So that relationship's already been established, and it's not going to do me any good to you know, puff up and say, look how important I am. It's going to be emotional stuff, because you use, usually have these conversations with people that you already know, that already know you, right? So now I've got these three buckets. 
And when I'm creating content, I'd love to fill all three if I can with one, one piece of content, but I know I need to at least fill one or two. So think about content that way as well. And really, it comes down to creating these offline experiences, right? So this is what happens when we invite people into the Chevy program. You get this cool die-cut card that's yours for life and will never sign someone else your number that you carry around with you. You get this card in the mail. This whole thing happens, right? This offline thing happens because something's been triggered online, right? We've got Maker's Mark. Anyone here Maker's Mark ambassador? Oh, come on. Anyone here like Maker's Mark? All right, they have a big booze fest each year. So you go, you go online, and uh, you can sign up for Maker's Mark, and uh, you get business cards in the mail, but also they put your name on a barrel of whiskey, and you can be the first one to go drink from it. I don't know how that works. And then each year they have uh, Redheads and Thoroughbreds in Louisville, which is right around the time of the Kentucky Derby. It's a big booze fest, and you can go and actually dip the bottles in the iconic red wax. You become a part of the experience, right? It is online and offline coming together, and that is my challenge to you since I'm out of time is that these two worlds need to come together. Anytime you create something on, uh, online, make sure there's an offline something that happens. Anytime you create something that happens offline, whether it be an event or some sort of customer experience, make sure there are triggers built in that people are going to go and talk about that thing online. And then social and word of mouth can live together happily ever after. Thanks, guys. So I wanted to go back for a second to the, you know, your clients want to see all of the likes. I work with a lot of um, companies in the produce industry, and that's very important to them. And my business flourishes only when I have their support. So I find myself constantly saying, like, quantity over quality, come on, let me explain this to you, and they just don't get it. So how do you, I guess, broach that? Uh, situation with your clients? So we're not saying necessarily it's bad to have all these followers because now we're, we are exposing ourselves to more people, but let's go about it in a way where we're going to attract people that actually like us, that are like-minded, right? Great Poupon Facebook page, anybody? Great Poupon? You remember the Great Poupon commercials? Like the two old dudes with the, if you try to go become a Great Poupon like a, the, the page, you have to actually take a test to see if you're snooty enough to become a member of their community. So now everybody wins. So I'm kind of keeping people out, but now it's a very talkable thing, right? We're turning social media on its head, right? And so they're getting the numbers because people are talking about the experience of becoming. So we don't go to them and go, no, we're not going to get 6 million likes for you. We're just not going to do it. Yes, we're going to go do that because I need to get paid. But let's go about it in a way where I can make sure that the quality of those people is, is who I want, and I'm going to have more than that 1% engagement rate that people get on their Facebook pages. 